Good morning. It's June 23rd, 2021. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. Could mean only one thing. Time for What Now America? I'm Tim Apicell, your host. The title of today's show is COVID Delta variant may hit red states hard. Um, right now, we're looking at a variant called the Delta variant. It is 60% more transmissible than the, the, the initial COVID-19. Uh, it's, it's said that um, if you have two shots of either Moderna or, or Pfizer, that you're 90, 88 to 90% protected from this Delta variant. And uh, if you're one shot in, you're only 49% uh, effectively protected. Uh, right now, the cases in the United States is about 20% of this Delta variant. And it is described that it's COVID on steroids. It's a lot more potent. It's a lot more deadlier. And for whatever reason, it's now affecting uh, the 35-year-old population down to the younger population. So it's not just an old folks uh, uh, variant. It's, it's hitting everybody. And uh, certainly those that are younger. Uh, I'd like to introduce our guests. Today we have Jay Fidel and Stephanie Dalton. Thank you for joining us on What Now America. Yeah, nice to see you, Tim. Good to see you too. Hey, Jay, before I go to a question here, I want to read something Dr. Fauci said yesterday, and he was quoted to say, every death from COVID-19 is avoidable, and it's a tragedy when it happens. It is on us to get those who are hesitant about getting a vaccine because they want more information, the information they need to make the decision. Unfortunately, however, there are some who continue to pollute the space with nonsense, pushing people in opposite direction. Uh, let me get your reaction to that quote and then I have a, a follow-up on that. Hmm. I've come to feel that hesitancy, at least in most cases, is a euphemism. I don't know why we use that term for people who have politicized it and who listen to the misinformation, disinformation, and outright lies uh, that are being, you know, disseminated to them about the, the vaccine. Um, it's a matter of life and death, and it's their lives and their deaths. I mean, could that be more persuasive? And yet, I, this is out of Jonestown. Uh, out of uh, it's it's out of a, a suicidal wish. Um, quite remarkable that they're still quote hesitant about saving their own lives. And we have a you know certain parts of the country which are you know demographically red states and Trump states and base states and states in which this has been politicized to most of the populations. Quite remarkable that people. I don't know what's in their minds. I don't know why they come to a conclusion that puts their lives at risk. Well, let me interrupt but, you right there, Jay. Um, is Dr. Fauci doing us a disservice by taking the high road that say that those who have not been vaccinated are um, hesitant about information, whereas in the truth of the matter in, in a lot of red states is they're not hesitant at all. They've made up their minds. And that mind is I'm not taking the vaccine because either I believe in Donald Trump and what he wants me to do, or it's a conspiracy to take this this vaccine. Well, I you know I've 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 come to this conclusion over the past few weeks um, that the government mm, is um, never going to be inclined to create a public panic, and the government is going to be careful about about saying that we're you know in a surge that will kill thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people. Um, it's just not going to do that. So it's very soft. It's very euphemistic, including Tony Fauci. Um, and I understand that. But we here, us guys, we should understand that the, the government doesn't want to create a panic and is therefore going to soften its message. I think that is the reality. You know, right now I'm traveling in the Northeast. Uh, I'm in Rhode Island right now. And you would know that there was a pandemic. Um, there are no masks anywhere. Uh, in stores and restaurants, uh, indoors, um, there's none. And maybe that's because the Northeast states, particularly Vermont, I believe it is 85 to 90 percent vaccinated. So the percentage of the Northeast states is well above 60, uh, broaching 70 percent that uh, President Biden was looking for by July 4th. Now, compare that to some of the red states where they're well below 35 percent. And so Dr. Fauci just said today that 300 people are dying each day right now, according to job, 
John Hopkins. And that number has to go up the more these, uh, the Delta variant becomes part of the, the commonplace uh, replacement for COVID-19. Uh, that number has to go up by definition. I mean, let me, let me uh, add another thought before you go to Stephanie, and that, and that is this. The government is also telling us, as you mentioned in, in, in some detail, um, that if you've had a couple of shots uh, with uh, Pfizer or Moderna, you, you know, you're pretty well protected. Um, but we're only out of the box for most people by, what, three months or four months max? Um, what kind of you know, database do we have? Well, have we had the opportunity to examine how this works? Delta is only, in the United States, it's only a, what, a month old, maybe, maybe less. So the bottom line is we have no experience factor on which to make the conclusion uh, that most people who have had two shots are protected. Um, I'm not sure that's true. Uh, I, we'll know a lot more about it as, as we go on for a few months. But right now, all you have to do is the math. And you realize that that, is, that cannot be necessarily the case. Okay, well, you're right, Jay. Um, we don't know everything, but you know there is a sum to more argument, and it's not always a valid form of argument. But in Florida, there were um, a cluster of people infected by the Delta variant, and uh, two uh, individuals were killed. Four are, are in the hospital, serious, uh, in ICUs. Uh, but there were two employees of this group that were fully vaccinated with Pfizer, and they weren't affected at all. Yet they were in the same office airspace. So I'm not going to say and extrapolate this situation to other situations that may or may not involve the, the Delta variant, but it's, it's hopeful that a two-dose Pfizer or Moderna shot is actually will blunt the, the harmful effects of this Delta variant. No, it's, I, it's, all, it's a gradient, you know what I mean? <clears throat> we don't know exactly what the degree is. Maybe yes, maybe somewhere in the middle. And um, I, I just, I don't, I don't think we know yet. I wouldn't take the, you know, last night my wife and I went out to dinner. We haven't done that a lot. And we wore masks most of the time. It was sloppy trying to eat through the mask, but hey, uh, we weren't that hungry anyway. <laughs> but well, what about you, Stephanie? How do you feel about this? <laughs> well, that just raised a, a scary prospect, uh, Tim. I mean, I, 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 I heard you say, I mean, those people, are in terrible trouble, and we all are, if it's possible, um, that we're going to find out there's a degree of us that are still vulnerable, even though we have our shots and have followed the directions. So we'll have to wait and see on, on that. But I, I think to the vulnerability of these states with these low levels of vaccination, it's very frightening because this, this could really grab hold of those people and take them where they don't want to go and, you know, get their, their health care systems in trouble. And I have also heard uh, that there's great concern for those states um, as they are tending to be rural in the South and that they are also very limited for health care. So there are very few health care facilities throughout those states anyway for anything. So the, the whole notion is, I mean, they're not running in there when they've got the flu or cold or you know, some asthma or something like that, that, you know, they're not used to having access to medical facilities and therefore they're not getting the guidance and they're not hearing the caring concern for the population and, and, and giving and being given, you know, the, the advice that this is uh, something that's very important to do. And right. that's all come because of their politics. I mean, there's, let me go back to the Obamacare and how uh, many of these states, you know, didn't take the expansion of Medicare, and still some are, are fighting over that, that they're not gonna take it, even though the residents are pleading to take it because it'll make such a big difference in the numbers of people who can afford to have health care um, from that. So, so there- you know, Stephanie, your answer really highlights um, kind of uh, a question that's just come in from a viewer, but your, your, your answer highlights the fact that because we have such political uh, polarization, that maybe the federal government has backed off on enforcement or, or, you know, trying to work closer with states to say, we need to be more stringent about, you know, uh, trying to contain this variant or the original COVID-19, which of course was never done under Donald Trump's administration. But because of the political polarization, there's a hesit hesitancy to do so. 
So I lead to the question from this, um, from one of our viewers, and we appreciate this viewer's comment here is, the Philippines president threatens to arrest those who refuse the vaccine. Will America have to resort to these same drastic measures? Well, I, uh, we have missed the boat on building that, that unity, that unifying um, intention, that co broad community understanding that we're all in this together. We never got that boat. We, the train left the station long before there was any building of that cons consideration for us all together helping each other out. It's been exactly what you say, polarized in the opposite. So now we also have Mitch McConnell coming up and saying, well, no, he's not voting for any federal, uh, you know, drastic uh, requirement for everybody to lockstep and go fascist. And so he's, she's bringing up again that we don't want that federal intervention, don't want anything that's going to tell everybody to do it the same way because there's absolutely no values being built and, and we evidently have no norms left from the days when we did act out as a, a country together, like after 9-11, every, you know, buddy was, um, you know, a part of that recovery and everybody was affected by it. So it's very worrisome to, to see that because in, in addition to the poverty issues um, and then the, 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 um, lack of medical care facilities, much less support and uh, assistance for people in those states. We have somebody that just blasted any kind of notion that we're all in this together. We all care about all Americans. We want all Americans to get through this and we wanna get rid of the bug. So we're just off on this other crazy uh, polarized route that isn't gonna do anybody any good. And so wow. I, we have the option to do anything federally. I really don't think it will. It would work. Whether we care about them or not, they're going to have an inordinate number of deaths in those states. Um, but it's worse. You know, you can travel from one of those states to another state. Um, and, you know, is our screening really adequate? Um, we are not requiring the vaccines. I mean, you know, sometimes you wish you were in the Philippines. But here's one thing that I, I think is worth discussing. We know as a medical fact that, you know, how do these variants come about? They come about when you have a large number of cases. The more, there's probably a formula out there somewhere in science land. The more cases you have, the higher the probability of another variant, a variant that's worse than the Delta variant. Okay, and those, those red states where nobody's getting vaccinated, nobody's requiring or even encouraging people to get vaccinated, those states are a hotbed for another variant, a variant that will be worse. So I think it's not just them, you know, if they want to kill themselves, fine, but it's all of us. We're all affected by the lowest common denominator, so to speak. Jay, what, what leverage does the federal government have against those either uh, state governments or, or city governments that flat out refuse to do anything about um, either the original COVID or now the Delta virus, or as you, as you suggest, maybe a variant that's even gonna be worse than the Delta variant. What, what leverage does the federal government really have to say, hey, you know, it's not just, you know, it's e pluribus unum from one many. Uh, you, you are not an island unto yourself. You're part of the 50 states, the United States, and you are fellow citizens, whether they know it or not, are infecting other citizens. Well, um, you know, to go where Duterte has gone and arrest people, make it criminal, we're not there yet. Uh, what I mean is we haven't done the interim possibilities, and there are interim possibilities. For example, if you can't prove that you've had a vaccination, first of all, vaccination passports, I don't know why anybody would oppose that. Um, <clears throat> and secondly, you know, if you, if you, uh, if you can take a plane, that's federally regulated. You can't take a plane. Um, uh, hypothetically, without having a vaccination. You want to get federal funding, you want to appear for federal benefits, you want to you know, collect your social security, whatever it is, a million things. The federal government is all over our lives. They regulate everything in every state. It is so easy for them to say, look, we're not giving you that benefit. We're, we're not going to um, allow you to have you know, what you had before unless you prove up for the passport or some good proof that you've been vaccinated. You don't have to go to jail. You don't have to arrest anybody. You don't have to get into a street scene about it. 
All you have to do is, is put a lock on benefits that were previously available. This is easy. I don't actually know why the administration is not tightening the noose on this. Well, that's that's the question. I mean, let's let's hypothetically go down that road. Unfortunately, that we go back to the fourth wave where it's not 300 people a day dying from COVID. It's now back up in the thousands. Um, would it be prudent for the federal government to say a vaccination passport now is required, whether you feel your HIPAA rights are being violated or not, or whether your personal freedoms are being trampled upon or not? We're trying to stamp out a pandemic and you're not helping. Well, I, I just wanted to jump in because uh, I was very interested in this when when we first, as Hawaii, started to close our gates. And of course, the question is, well, why can't we close them completely? Well, just like Alaska and other states, and Alaska is most comparable because they actually could close their border. But um, that is that is not allowed by the Constitution because we have interstate commerce. So the so the reference uh, Jay made before about how you can leave leave a state and go to another state with all of your infection. There's nothing to stop you from doing that, and the federal government can't do that because we must have we have we must be able to pass across and through these United States. So that's in the law. And then now this this. Uh, meme or this diatribe about fascism and doing anything by the federal government is an act of control over everybody that is not to be tolerated is then getting in the way of um, making this the um, make it, that that's an argument for states rights to do these things but states are not islands on their own and that there, there just isn't a recognition of how this is all supposed to work together, which we've done for hundreds of years. Right. It's an intention of the let me, let me go to an argument that those who refuse to get vaccinated use and use often. And that is, you know, a lot of drugs that the FDA approves and studied for five years or 10 years, uh, they, they allowed these drugs to go on the market. And lo and behold, a number of them, particularly like uh, blood thinners and or, you know, um, all sorts of medicines turned out to be harmful versus the intended um, benefit that were, they were supposed to provide to the marketplace. So they had to take them off the market. And so take that logic. And now they're saying, well, how long did you really study COVID and how much <clears throat> did the FDA really uh, put in time? It was less than one year. And here they're expecting the entire population of the United States to be uh, vaccinated. And do we really know the long-term effects uh, of it? So they use that as why they one of the reasons why they don't want to get it. Um, and then we have news stories like today, just before this show, it was announced that uh, the FDA is now putting out a new warning that there might be an unexpected um, inflammation to uh, particularly in teens uh, of the heart of, uh, of the cardio system. And that for whatever reason, Pfizer and Moderna may may now have this new warning attached to it. So what I'm getting at is we have, you know, this uh, initial hesitancy or, or belief that the FDA doesn't really know what they approved, but yet we're all required to take it. And now, see, we told you there's a new warning coming up. Um, how do you combat that kind of uh, uh, argument? And uh, do they have a point at all? Well, they may yeah. have a point with, a, with a, a small number of people. I mean, there are side effects. Uh, I don't think any of them are really serious. And by the way, just as there was an article about the inflammation, there was also an article about black fungus. I don't know if you saw that. This is a COVID effect. And if you have COVID, you stand the chance of developing black fungus on your eyes. And, okay. that, will, and that will make you blind. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's a matter of weighing and balancing. But I think the numbers, and, and of course, as Stephanie says, it's the greater good we care about. We want to save lives. We don't want to see 300 or 600 or 1,000 people die every day. They've got to get on board. And so, you know, interesting. <clears throat> I go for a regular medical appointment, okay? And I go to, you know, one of my doctor's offices. And before I walk in, at least two people are taking my temperature and asking me if I've been anywhere. But every day happens, everywhere you go, even in that restaurant last night, everywhere. Um, <clears throat> suppose I said, well, Actually, I, I have a little bit of a headache. I feel like I have a fever. And I, I just came back from the UK, for example. 
Um, and I think I might have COVID. You know? I suppose I said that. Well, I wouldn't get in the restaurant, that's for sure. But would I get in to see my doctor? Probably not. Would I get in to, to have any medical care if I had that interaction with the people who stand at the gate and take my temperature? Probably not. So what you have is this kind of de facto thing. It's imperfect because there are other symptoms that could be identified. But if I had to show that I've been vaccinated in order to have other medical care, if I had to show that I wasn't dangerous to do this, that, and the other thing, that would be a de facto way of preventing the spread. And I would suffer. I couldn't have these benefits. So I'm, I'm adding to what I said before about the federal government you know, putting, putting guardrails on benefits. Uh, every business can have that benefit. Um, every, every organization of any kind can deny you entry. I think a lot of them are afraid. And if I was an employer and somebody said, well, I'm hesitant about taking, taking the vaccine, I would say, there's the door. You can't, we can't have you here because you're endangering the rest of us. Sorry. So what do you say? What do you say about those state governments? And I'm thinking of Florida. You know, DeSantis is going to run for president of the United States. It's all but in the, you know in the stars. Um, and he's making a political gesture to say we don't need to do these things that the federal government wants us to do. And we know better for what's good for our population. And uh, but mass be damn, I don't. We don't care. So what do you do about governors like DeSantis of Florida, who actually is working against trying to spread this virus versus trying to prevent it? The history books will judge him going forward, but the question is right now. I'm sure your question is right now. And the answer is that's why we have a federal government to deal with emergencies like this. And although Stephanie says it may be a violation of the constitution to stop people from traveling across state lines and, and various other things, I mean, the, you know, the, the supremacists and the, and the uh, Republicans claim um, you know, that, that it's a violation of their constitutional rights um, to deny them entry and require them to, to have a vaccine. And I say, these are desperate times. And frankly, I think they're likely to become more desperate times. And the government has to save the greater number of people. We can't stand by, the federal government cannot morally stand by, do its duty and allow thousands of people to die uh, from what, is amount, what amounts to a preventable death, preventable disease. So, I mean, maybe, maybe we're not clear on that yet. Maybe it'll take another 500,000 people, uh, 500,000 deaths to make it clear. But we have to do something to survive as a nation. And if that means, um, you know, putting some gloss on the Constitution, if it means finding other ways, then Joe Biden has got to do that. All right. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Stephanie, Dr. Fauci no longer has Donald Trump as his boss's boss. Um, he's free of that, that hanging sword of termination of employment over his head. Probably got a fairly good situation where he is right now with Joe Biden. Um, does Dr. Fauci and his peers uh, need to be more stringent in their criticisms of what's going on and what really needs to take place versus addressing a generalized hesitancy to take the vaccination? Well, I think this situation is... Uh really fraught with so many uh, nuances or variables. I mean, first of all, Fauci's a public health person. I mean, he's a, in the National Public Health Service, so I don't think he's do, he, he's, he'd be harder to get rid of than somebody out of the- Well, of you know, let me interrupt. You know, Dr. Bricks, uh, they pussyfooted around. They, you know, they tried to call it and tell it like it was. And, you know, Donald Trump had that hanging sword of, I'll fire you if you say something I don't like. Um, right. That sort of has been removed for the most part. Is it up to public health officials to say and step in and say, uh, this variant's gonna start killing thousands of people more and we gotta do something about it right this second. Uh, we're not getting that right well, now. Dr. Fauci has put out a generalized warning, but it's not as, um, uh, you know, as a definitive that it, maybe it ought to be. Well, I think that we're up against a, a, di a difficulty in this situation that we haven't much had before. I mean, maybe we came close to it when they brought the Ebola patients back to the U.S. from Africa. I think there was a, a general concern that, that bringing anybody with that into this country was very dangerous because that spreads like wildfire. 
this particular virus, while it's very contagious, it's not the kind of thing like, um, you know, these other, the yellow fever and, and typhoid and all of these other tremendous killers who we have controlled in the past and have overcome and have led the world in getting to know how to manage it and manage it as a country. And, uh, but with this uh, coronavirus, it's been a slower um, spread and people don't see the, the direct, you know, the line between A and B is not. Yeah, but those days are over, I, I'm, Stephanie. I hate to inform you, but this, this uh, Delta is 60% more transmissible than the coronavirus. And by the way, coronavirus was highly transmissible. So, you know, you, you've gone to England and Spain who are now shutting down again. They have to shut down. And you have Germany and France watching their, their clusters of population. And unfortunately, most of the cases are of the Delta variant versus the original coronavirus. Well, that, that is true. And it, it may take a, an effect. But again, it looks like this Delta is going after a particular segment of the population. I don't know enough about it to speak in any way as, uh, to inform you on that. But as I understand it, again, it's, uh, uh, it may be more contagious, but it's like at the beginning of, of the corona, it was the old people. And it was the people that weren't the, the, the heart of the American population. And I think that that had a real big effect on people. It wasn't going to bother me. It's not going to come get me. It's going to get all these old people. It's going to get these people who are in. Right, exactly. They're vulnerable. I'm not vulnerable. So nobody's feeling vulnerable in the middle of the country and in the middle of the population. So I think until all of those people feel that they are vulnerable, we can't have this unifying effect because if it's only going to be the certain populations that are are um, devastated by this and literally devastated as they have been, the rest of them don't seem to care. And that has well, unfortunately, to feel vulnerable does that mean thousands and thousands of more deaths? Exactly. To they those that didn't, and I'll quote Fauci again. I'll quote him again. Um, every death from COVID-19 is avoidable and it's a tragedy when it happens. In, yes, it, in the abstract, but in the actual being here in this country and wanting to go to football games and wanting to go to the bar. And I'm a young guy and I'm a young gal and I, they, nobody else like me is getting it. So um, there has to be, um, in, in addition to um, the uh, all we do, there has to be that sense of vulnerability to pull us all together, it, it seems, with the people that we have now, because they just don't do things in the abstract. I mean, we've done polio. I mean, we've done all of these huge, really bad bugs and gotten them under control and had a whole nation working on it. And we're just not having that kind of a, uh, you know, a re reception, you know, uh, um, um, an effect, you know, going, going to, to make us be one of the nations that could um, take care of it and have it absolutely go away. We could, we have the capacity to do that, but we haven't done that because the will has not been there of the people. And then we have these leaders who are also being real goofy about it and not seeing that it is a national issue and they're tearing it apart and making it a state's rights issue for what for purposes that are really undiscernible and uh, very difficult to understand. And I think we could well, have done it much better. And we yeah, can- I guess, you know, as time, yeah, as time goes on, I think ultimate responsibility, and Jay, you suggested it with about DeSantis, is as time goes on, we'll see where the ultimate responsibility or the, the lack of responsibility took place on how you messaged to your, your, your constituents and whether you did the right thing or not the right thing to either take this thing seriously or uh, pass it off as our freedoms are being impinged upon. Therefore, you know, we'll stand up as Americans and, and do it our way, our own way. So, okay, um, you know, the best part of the show, I, I, well, not the best part, but one of my favorite parts of the show is, is asking you what your final comments are and, uh, your final comments as it pertains either to the Delta variant or, or anything else on the table. It's your moment to say, this is what I think, and here's what's coming up for the next week. Jay. Well, listening to this discussion, participating in, you know, in the public conversation about COVID, um, I, I don't know if we give enough credit to the implications of having another major surge, which hundreds of thousands of preventable deaths take place. 
because there are secondary effects to that. We have already seen firsthand how that works, how it, how it reaches everyone, including those who were not infected. What about the economy? What about, you know, the, what about the, the, the mental the sensibilities of individuals whose family has been infected? Um, you know, what about planning for the future? What about starting a business? Um, what about the, you know, the backbone of the country in terms of entrepreneurship and, and, you know, and business development of every single kind, anywhere, everywhere? It will be affected because, you know, when you go through this a second time, a second major surge, wow, people are going to be really, really, really unhappy, depressed in every way. And the country's economy would be depressed. The world itself will be depressed. It's already depressed. I mean, it's nice that uh, Biden can try to reestablish um, relations with, um, you know, Western countries and, and do what he did in, uh, in Europe. But the reality is that they're also affected. Their economies are also affected. We have the world on a precipice here. So it's not just a few numbers in the South. Thank you, Jay. You know, there's a reason why I love to go around the table and ask for final comments, because I get comments like that. Thank you, Jay. Stephanie, your turn. Well, I, you know, I think in Hawaii, um, but people are wishing or prefer to have control. I, you know, this is a, a beautiful place, and this is a thriving economy. It was a thriving economy, but it almost got taken down to its, its heels. I mean, it was taken down to its heels. And I mean, we were standing alone on Waikiki. You could go to the Waikiki beach and be there by yourself. Um, so we- I did. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> so we, we've suffered exactly what Jay's talking about is the effects uh, on the economy. And that's exactly what's gonna happen. So, um, but uh, he, and here again, I, and I think in our state, not to brag, but we do have a sense of aloha. Everybody's in the same boat when the tsunami comes, you know, or the hurricane, we're all in it together. And by the way, they don't ever use the E word here for here hurricanes, because there is no evacuation. <laughs> we are here for the duration, uh, no getting out. So um, I think we've got some circumstances that help us be unified. And those circumstances are not uh, very uh, well-defined for the whole country and, and this crisis. Maybe if we'd had a different president leader at the beginning of it who did focus on these things in, and even in the abstract for some, we would be much better off. But we're, we are where we are. And, but in our state, I think we do have a good sense of how this is uh, for, uh, about everybody and everybody working hard on it and our leaders taking um, some direction from what the residents see and need to have happen to them. Okay, thank you, Stephanie, for your thoughtful th uh, comments. You know, I, I'd just like to say that, you know, we don't know exactly how this Delta variant is gonna take place and particularly in those states where vaccination percentages are quite low. But I just pray that my fellow Americans uh, realize that this isn't, this isn't a game and wasn't a game when we had the regular COVID-19 virus, but now we have something much more deadlier. And I just hope that they set aside politics and do what they can do for themselves and their families and friends and get a vaccination. So with that said, I'd like to thank Jay Fidel and you, Stephanie Dalton. Thank you for joining us on What Now America? Join us next week, Wednesday at 11 o'clock. And I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and we'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha, Tim. Aloha, Stephanie.